talking about line search based methods where we basically repeated two steps over and over. We picked a direction and then did a search along that direction, chose a point, and repeated. Today we're going to talk about an alternate approach uh, for these unconstrained problems where we still use gradients. And these are these years what's called the trust region approach. Uh, this is a, a sort of diagram of the method, but basically I'm going to write down the steps. They're basically just two steps, kind of similar to the line search, two things that we repeat over and over again. First, we're going to create a model about the current point, a local model. Create a model about current point. So about current point might suggest to your mind a Taylor series, and that's a common way to do it. Um, so we could build, for example, a local quadratic model. That's the most common approach. But it could be any surrogate model. We could build any sort of model based on, you know, for a quadratic with a Taylor series, we'd use our function gradient Hessian at that point. But we could use previous evaluation points. We could build any sort of model. Okay, so but it's a model that we uh, since it's built based on local information, we believe it to be true in some local region. It's not as, our, our real function is potentially much more complicated. But we've built a simplified model that, again, because it's only using current or local information, it's only going to be a good approximation nearby. So what we're going to do is we have this model, we're going to minimize the model. Minimize the model. So we'll find the, the point within or on that model that provides the minimum solution within what we call a trust region. This kind of encapsulates that idea that we were just discussing that our local model, we know nearby should be a good approximation, but as we go further away, we have no idea how well our model is going to work. And so this trust region is kind of the size, if you will of how far do we trust our model. Outside of that trust region, we think it's bogus. Inside, it seems like within here, it's probably a good approximation. So in other words, if the minimum was way far away, we don't want to accept that point. It's probably going to send us somewhere that's no good. Just because our model says there's a good point there, it's too far away to trust it. So we're going to constrain the problem to find the minimum within some sort of boundary. And we'll talk about how to size this boundary. There are many ways to do this boundary too, but the most common is going to be a sphere, a radius, right? So this could be a sphere, circle in 2D, sphere in 3D, hypersphere in higher dimensions, just a radius that we define. Okay, so once we choose this point, then we, you know, those are the main two steps. So now we're just going to move and update and resize the trust region, resize the trust region as needed. Okay. So again, we're basically repeating two steps over and over. These are not the same steps in the line search. We create a local model, and then we find the minimum of that model within some region and repeat again and again. So let's look at some examples of what this might look like. Let's start with a, a nice simple function. This is that bean function. It varies gradually. It has some curvature, but the variation is pretty gradual. Here's my current point, and I'm going to use a quadratic model. So I evaluate my function, my gradient, and my Hessian at that point. And from that Taylor series approximation, I can build this quadratic. So these blue curves are the underlying true function. Black, this is my local approximation about this point. And you can see nearby the contours overlap nicely. It's a, a good approximation. As I get further away over here, right, it's not so good. So I wouldn't trust my model very far away. But here is the minimum of that function. And in this case, that does a good job. Even if I didn't have a trust region, this would work quite well. And in fact, this would be a Newton step. Without the trust region, it would just be, if we did a quadratic model, just taking Newton steps. Um, as we talked about the Newton method, it has some difficulties, right, where it might not be positive definite and, and things like that. Uh, there, this is one way to kind of deal with that is to provide a region to say we're, we're only going to trust, within, trust it within some certain region. Okay, but this is a nice uh, kind of gradual function. Let's look at one a little more complicated. This is the Rosenbrock that we've seen a bunch of times. It's a bit more aggressive, right? It has um, the sort of narrow valley that curves. So here's my current iteration. I take that 
function green and Hessian to build the, that uh, local quadratic gives me these gray curves here. A minimum of that model is here. Um, that's not necessarily a bad point, uh, but you could see that in general, I could get very bad points, right? Uh, it's not too hard to imagine a scenario where it sends me way off where the model is a very bad approximation. You can see it's a decent approximation here, but even over here, it's not looking so good. And in fact, even in this problem, it's not clear that's really such a great solution. The minimum is way over here. It's kind of taking me over there. Uh, but that's, you know, that's not super bad. But let's see how that trust region is going to work. Now imagine I draw a circle. Right? A circle is going to be a constraint. I want my solution to, I want to find the minimum within that circle. So let's, just to start, let's put a circle just so it just barely touches that solution. So nothing has changed. The minimum is not going to change, right? Because it's now just right in that circle. Now let's say I shrunk that trust region. I'm going to make it smaller. What's going to happen to my search directions? Take a moment and kind of sketch that out. What is this going to look like? So if I shrink this radius, the minimum is going to kind of curve in kind of like this, right? Because as this radius gets smaller, the minimum is over here. The closest I can get is going to kind of come in closer towards this point. So for example, here's one. I notice the direction is different. And here's another as I shrink. Um, and here's the difference from the line search, right? It's, they're almost kind of inverses, but actually even, but that's a little bit oversimplification. Um, in the line search, right, we picked a direction. And once we pick that direction, we search along it. Here, we're not picking a direction. We're picking a, a radius, a max size, a trust region. And we're finding the minimum within that radius. So here's my trust region. The model is in gray. I'm trying to find the model or the minimum of the gray function that is within this circle. And that's going to be this point here. I don't do any sort of iterating a line search on that. I just take that point. That's why we call this an S, not P, because P, we said it was a direction that we're going to multiply by alpha for that line search. Here, this is the step. We minimize, we take it, and, and we move on. So you can see that the size of that trust region is very important. As we varied that size, the step length that we got changed quite a bit, right? We are getting very different solutions. Now let's go back to this point. What happens if I made the trust region bigger? Well, if I make it bigger, the solution isn't going to change, right? Because I'm trying to find the minimum of this model, these gray curves. And if the trust region is bigger, it's just not constraining me, right? I'm not hitting that constraint. So it doesn't matter how big it gets. Uh, I, I'm not, it's not going to change the, the solution, the minimum within the circle. This is just to point out that just because I have a trust region doesn't mean I'm always going to hit the boundaries. If the minimum was within the, the region, then you know I don't hit the boundaries. So just to emphasize, we don't always hit the boundaries. Here's a, a contrasting point now. Um, so here's, again, a trust region. The minimum within there would be here. And so I would go directly to that point. Here, for example, is a steepest descent direction. Notice it's a very different direction. And we would do a line search if we're using a line search based method on that direction. Or, you know, even with the Newton's method, the difference would be here is we could use this as our direction. Um, but then we'd perform a line search along this rather than uh, just accepting some predetermined radius. We would use this as a direction and then search along here to see uh, until we get a good enough point. Okay, well, let's, let's write this down a little bit more formally as a math problem here, an optimization problem. The problem we would want to solve is we want to minimize a model of our function. So F tilde means it's a model of our function. Like the actual function here is in blue, the model here is in gray. It need not be a quadratic model, that's the most common, but it could be anything, any sort of strategy we come up with to build a local model. Our design variables are S, right? We're picking that step size. And again, we're not picking a direction P, we're picking the step that we take. So you could think of it as that combination of alpha and P. And we have a constraint that S has to lie within some boundary. We're going to constrain it so that it can't go too far. Now we've talked about circles or spheres. Uh, that's the most common, but there can be others. So this norm could be any norm. 
like for example, so, so the circle is a two norm. If I put a two here, that's called a two norm. That's the one you're used to seeing. That's the, you take each entry, square it, add them together, square root the whole thing. That's the Euclidean norm. That, that's what gives us a circle. If I put an infinity here, this would be an infinity norm. That actually creates boxes, like a box constraint, rectangular type of things, or really boxes and n dimensions. So let's write the most common. This is a general case. Again, this could be any model. This could be any sort of trust region. But the most common, and what we showed in this picture, is a quadratic model. So we'll minimize um, F tilde, where that's a Taylor series based on my local function gradient in Hessian. So I've got the gradient, my first order term, and then my second order term, S transpose times the Hessian. All right, so that's my Taylor series approximation using at my current point, function value, gradient, and Hessian. And that allows me to build this gray model here. That's what I want to minimize. And then subject to, we'll use the two norm again, because that's the most commonly used, though it doesn't have to be. And this radius, this trust region radius, can change from iteration to iteration. So we put a little iteration index on there. OK, again, this is just a specific instance of this more general problem. There are other forms, but this is the most commonly used. This problem is what we would call a QCQP. That stands for quadratically constrained quadratic programming. Um, that's because it has a quadratic objective. See, there's these S squared terms in here, and there are quadratic constraints. Remember that we could write this two norm this way, quadratic term, it's exactly the same. So I have a quadratic objective, quadratic constraints, Unfortunately, it doesn't have an analytic solution. So there's this nested optimization problem. So in practice, we actually don't solve this optimization problem exactly. It's too expensive. Um, there are various approximation techniques that are used. One is uh, called the dogleg method. But basically, um, we, we come up with a technique that works pretty well. It's going to be much faster. You know, it's just going to require, say, a linear solution that we used to update a previous step, it's going to approximate solving this problem. And there's some links in the book if you're interested in reading more about that. But the idea is that this is too expensive to solve at every iteration. Even though we can, it's not necessarily a hard problem, but it's um, more expensive, so we won't do that. OK, as we've discussed, uh, a really key thing we're seeing is what's that size of that trust region? And this is maybe a challenge of the method compared to the line search. The line search, we have kind of that step to recover from where we pick a direction and we can then do a line search. If it wasn't a good uh, step, we can kind of recover and find a, a good one. Here, that trust region is going to kind of dictate the problem. We choose it beforehand and uh, it, it better be a good one because, um, yeah, we're just going to kind of take that step. So we need some way to know if our trust region is doing a good job. So the question I'm going to ask you then first is, how do you know your trust region is doing a good job? What is a metric you might use to say, oh, the trust region is working well? So pause and take a minute and think about that. Let's look back at this function here. Remember, we have two things. We've got our true function in blue. We've got our model in gray. If the trust region was doing really well, right here, we've got our point and we've got our new point. We're, we have some um, decrease that we're anticipating in gray. And if the model was really great, then we, our actual decrease would be basically the same, right? That would be a really great model. So we're going to use this parameter R and compare the actual decrease that we get relative to our expected decrease. So again, the actual is with the true function F, the blue curves. Right? The expected decrease is F tilde, our model in gray. So how do we write that mathematically? See if you can write that down. The actual decrease, again, is our actual function. So you could write this in either order, right? Our initial minus final or final minus initial. It doesn't matter as long as we do the same top and bottom. But I'm going to write it as um, what we expect to be the bigger minus the smaller, so that each quantity would be positive, hopefully. So this is uh, where we start. This is where we end. 
And so if this is a minimization problem, we hope that our new step is going to be smaller. So we got a bigger minus smaller. This should be a positive quantity. It's not guaranteed, right? But that's what we hope. That's our actual decrease. Our expected decrease is based on F tilde, and that's a function of S. So we start at zero and we subtract the final point there. So this is going to be smaller. This is guaranteed to be positive here, right? This is bigger, and so this is going to be the minimum of F tilde. This has got to be smaller than this. So this quantity is going to be positive. So this is always positive. This we hope is positive. So again, F tilde, right? This is F tilde of zero, the gray function. This is F tilde of S for the gray function. So we're evaluating here and here for the gray function and here and here for the blue function and comparing those function values. So what's ideal? What would we love R to be? Well, we want R to be close to one, right? That our actual decrease and our expected decrease are basically the same. That means our model is doing really great, right? So if R is close to one, then the model agrees well with the actual function. That means everything is great, right? Um, what does it mean if R is bigger than one? Take a second, think about that. If R is bigger than one, then remember this is gonna be a positive if we get a decrease, right? This bigger or smaller, then we actually got more decrease than we expected. More decrease than we expected. That just means we got lucky. So we'll take it. That's still good. Luck is still good. Okay, what if R is negative? Well, if R is negative, remember this bottom is always gonna be positive in the way we've written it. If R was negative, that means this was bigger than this, meaning the function actually increased. We thought this is a minimum, this is the best point to go to, but our function got worse. So the function, oops, the function actually increased. That means the trust region is not doing a good job. It's too big. We went out to a point where our trust me, our, our model is not trustworthy. So the trust region is too big. Um, we've gone out too far. Uh, we predicted a really great point, but we got a lousy point. Okay, so we're gonna use this to, cr to uh, create an algorithm for how to resize the trust region. So at the end of every iteration, we can make this assessment. How well did we do compared to how well we thought we were gonna do? And that's gonna help us decide what should we do with the trust region? Should we leave it alone, make it bigger, make it smaller? So I'm gonna write down an algorithm and there's some numbers in here. These are uh, obviously not, they don't need to be these exact numbers. These are common numbers from the literature, um, but these can vary and can be tuned if needed. So first, our first criteria is gonna be, what if R is less than 0 0.05? What does that mean? Well, remember negative, that was really bad. Um, but if it's even close to that, that's bad too, right? I mean, if I'm getting like 0 0.05, that means I expected this great decrease and I got barely anything. So, you know, we have to pick some threshold somewhere. This is a, a typical value used in literature. So this says the model was bad. I got hardly any decrease at all, or I even got an increase. So let's shrink the trust region. Our step size of the next iteration is going to be our last one. But we're going to divide it by four. So we're going to make a smaller trust region. In fact, we're even going to do one more than that. We're going to reject that step completely. We're not going to even move. So we thought we get a good step, but it didn't happen. Let's shrink the trust region and do that iteration over. We'll find a new minimum within the smaller trust region and try a new step. Okay, the next criteria we're going to look at, what if R, what's a good case? So if R is greater than or equal to 0.9, right? One is what we wanted, so this is really good. And if it's bigger, then we're lucky, but that's also great. So this means things are doing well. What should we do in that case? Well, you may say, well, we should grow the trust region, but not necessarily, right? Um, we should grow the trust region only if the model is good and we hit a boundary. So if if we, the trust reading was good, we got an R that was a, a nice high value, 
but we didn't hit the boundary. The minimum was somewhere within that circle. And the trust region is probably about the right size, right? Because you know the minimum was within the region. That's great. But if the model's predicting really well and we hit the boundary, that means that if the boundary had been larger, we probably would have gone further. So our boundary is a bit too constraining. So we should make it bigger. So if, if the model's good and the step size we wanted is hitting the boundary. Uh, yeah, I'll just write, well, I'll just write lambda, or sorry, delta k. And we hit the boundary, then, you know, we should do, um, we should grow it. Let's make it bigger. So we will double its size. One other detail, though, is that um, we don't want to always double. We want to provide some sort of max, biggest that it could be. Because what could happen is that we could get several good steps where we're hitting the boundary. And if it just keeps growing and growing and growing, um, we may then have other iterations later where it's really poor and it could take a long time to start shrinking down and it may slow down our progress a lot because especially when we shrink, right? We don't even take a step at all. So that can be expensive. So usually what we do is we compare that, we double it as long as it's not bigger than some absolute size that we're gonna provide. Often the user might provide like this is sort of a, a let's say a, a scale that I want to use. This is going to be the biggest trust region that, that we could use. Okay, so it'll double it unless we hit that biggest size and then it will never grow beyond that. Otherwise, we're just going to keep the size as is. So it could be good, great model, but we're within the region, things are good. It could be an okay model, may have hit the bound or not, but you know, seems to be working okay. So we'll just keep it as is. The only reason we're ever going to change is if things are really bad, then we better shrink. Or if they're really great and we hit a boundary, then we better grow. Okay, and like I said, of course, these numbers, these are just common ones from the literature, but, uh, you know, these can vary. All right, so let's look at a um, little example real quick. Um, here's an example of, uh, this is a function, this is a sort of physical example with these two springs. Um, and uh, we're going to use a trust region-based approach. So let's notice first, here's our starting point, S0 right here, right? Here's our starting point. We built a model, it's this local quadratic. It's probably okay locally. You can see it's really bad far away. So we've got kind of this small starting trust region and we took a step and we hit the boundary. So we're gonna move there. We're gonna build a new model, update our trust region. A few iterations later, we're over here. Uh, trust region's a bit bigger. Um, it's, you know, it looks okay, but uh, you know, we're still hitting that, kind of hitting the trust region. Now it's getting a little better. These contours are matching a little better over maybe a little bit wider range. I'll keep moving. Uh, here the steps are getting big. In fact, the minimum of this one is not hitting the boundary at all. The minimum of our, our model in gray is right here. And that's pretty good, right? Uh, these contours are starting to capture pretty well as we get close to the minimum and a few more iterations and we've converged. Okay, and there's another example in the book if you'd like to look at the Rosenbrock function. So to, to wrap up here, let's, um, let's talk a little bit about how trust region compares to line search. We've talked about how it compares algorithmically, but in terms of choice. Um, I'll say up front that the, the line search, BFGS in particular, is much more popular than trust region uh, because the trust region has some limitations that we'll talk about here. However, we still bring it up because the trust region, the idea of a trust region is actually a really useful one that occurs in some other algorithms beyond just unconstrained optimization. It's a useful idea to say we've got a local model that um, by definition, a local model works well locally, but shouldn't work everywhere. So let's put some bounds on this problem at trust region. But here are some of the limitations. So a trust region um, uh, needs an accurate Hessian, accurate Hessian. That's a rough way to say it. Um, what we're really saying is it's more sensitive to that Hessian because with the line search again, even if the Hessian is not quite as exact, we didn't actually just take that step we did a line search and so it can kind of recover a bit and still find a really good point, even if that, that Hessian that was using some approximate curvature information or approximation, even if that wasn't perfect, we're gonna recover. Here, once we've picked our trust region, 
we are choosing that step, right? It's going to find that minimum and we're just going to take it. There's no additional line search on top of that. So if that Hessian is really inaccurate, uh, it can be really hard to make it progress. In fact, many algorithms, like for example, in MATLAB, you have two options in, the, in FMinonc. It's the quasi-Newton, which uses the FGS or a trust region, but it won't let you use trust region unless you provide a Hessian. And again, the thought there is that if you can't provide an analytic Hessian, you probably shouldn't use this method because it's just not, it's just more sensitive to the accuracy of the Hessian. But if you can, then it, it can work quite well, right? If you can provide a Hessian. This is why I say this is maybe less popular. It's just that many of these large engineering problems, we can't provide a Hessian. And so the trust region is usually not as good of an option for, for these particular problems. Um, the trust region uses fewer iterations. This is maybe not necessarily a pro or con. It's hard to say. But each iteration is more expensive. And that's because, remember with our BFGS or a quasi newton methods, we just do a matrix vector multiply, which is really efficient. Um, in the trust region, we solve a QCQP. We actually don't solve a QCP, we solve an approximation of that, but that requires a, a matrix factorization, some sort of linear solve in general. And so it's, a, it's more computation expensive at each iteration. Lastly, scaling, um, I should say, Trust region is even more sensitive to scaling. This is something I've brought up uh, in class a few times, not necessarily in these videos. I should make a video just about scaling. But um, there are many ways that scaling shows up. And here's one in the trust region. So for example, you've seen this if you plot when you've plotted things before, you know, just say you're plotting a 1D function, but here I'm going to show contours. Um, say I plotted these things and they looked very circular. Well, you know, I can change the axes, like what's the scale I plot this along. And if I change the scale, the exact same numbers, right? I didn't change the function or the data, but I can stretch things out, right? And this occurs all the time, just one way is just based on the choice of units that I use, right? If I use different units, the scale of my problem is gonna be very different. And that plays a role here in the trust region because, right, I choose this radius and if I have different stretching on the problem, then the step sizes I can take are gonna be very different, right? As, a, as these contours of my function vary, um, this radius, you know, is just, it's gonna be much more sensitive to that. So every optimization problem is gonna be sensitive to scaling, but this is a, a particular challenge of trust regions that may be perhaps more sensitive. Uh, it, just by definition, the use of a circle assumes that things are changing fairly similarly in all directions. So we're not biasing, we're not over constraining one direction compared to another. Okay, so again, like I said, we don't as often use this uh, many uh, directly for unconstrained optimization, although there are places for it, right? Like I said, especially if you can provide a Hessian, it's a good option, um, but it's a, a powerful idea that's useful in, in other applications within optimization, some of which we may see later this semester. Okay, so this wraps up uh, our section on unconstrained optimization. Next, we're actually gonna talk about derivatives, a little different order than in the book, and we'll come back to constrained and then gradient-free next, but the next section we'll talk about uh, ways to compute derivatives.